Uh, open your Bibles if you brought them. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you tell us to buy these Bibles, and we rarely use them. That's because I just shout out verses and keep running. If you didn't bring your Bible, you can pull out your iPhone information device. Look it up there. If any of you sponsors or spouses or whatever, we have extra copies. I printed if anyone wants extra copies. I got extras here. <sighs> All right. Now, I'm not going to promise, I'm not going to promise that I won't cry. Because we're going to read some poetry today, people. Are you ready to read some poetry? It's weird, crazy, weird poetry. Okay? So Pope John Paul II, before he was, you know, all fancy and popish, he wrote a meditation on marriage called The Jeweler's Shop. Okay? He wrote a meditation on marriage called The Jeweler's Shop. It's a play. It's a poem. It's a meditation on marriage. It's weird. It's awesome. I love it. It is a series of monologues. Sometimes there are two characters in an act, but they don't really interact. Like one does a monologue, and then the other one addresses what that monologue was, but it's totally a series of monologues. Now, why is that? Because when Pope John Paul was Karol Wojtyla in Nazi-controlled Poland, one of the things that they would do was the secret Polish plays. They called it the Rhapsodic Theater of the Word, which sounds super hipster before it was cool. What are we going to do? So this is a Rhapsodic Theater of the Word? Like, it's not just about doing a play. Like, ooh, that's gross, right? So I'm sure he wore a... Scarf indoors and such like that. But um, he, the great thing about it was they had to cut the plays, these three, four-hour performances, down to 20-minute performances. Because if the Nazis found out, they would, be, they would just basically be taken off and executed. Why? Because these were signs of Polish cultural resistance to the Nazis. Right? So there was military resistance even after they were conquered, and there was cultural resistance. So the Pope was one of the leaders in the cultural resistance. I love this stuff. It's so fascinating. So he would meet in these small apartments, and they'd be filled with people, 100-plus people, jammed in. And they would take these plays, and they would boil the play down to its most essential component and deliver it as a form of sweeping, dramatic monologues. So that became one of the ways, from that point on, that he wrote his plays, his dramas, whatever you want to call them. Now, in the jeweler's shop, which, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to put this over my face again. Okay. And now, in the jeweler's shop, there is a, it's a three-act play. Act one involves a man named Andrew and Teresa, a woman named Teresa. They had just gotten engaged. Okay. Act two involves a woman named Anna, and she's talking to a man named Adam about her husband, uh, Stefan, or Stephen. We'll say Stefan. Stefan? Stefan. Stephan. We'll say Stephan. Okay. This is Americanized that crap. Okay. So, and then the third from the first marriage and the daughter Monica from the second marriage. Now, the reason why Act 2 is so important is Act 2 revolves around a crumbling marriage. The woman is actually in the process of trying to spiritually leave her husband so she can physically leave him. And she's out on the highways and the byways and she's walking down the street from this busy town, and she thinks that she's so ticked off that her brain is not her own anymore, that, it, that her husband fills even her thoughts, even though she no longer loves him. And she goes, and she has an encounter with this man named Adam, who is, surprise, surprise, Adam from the Bible, and he goes, and he has these series of intersecting monologues with her, I don't know what to call it, and at one point she turns to commit adultery. She wants to just go off in order to punish the image of her husband that is still within her, right? The love that is still there, even though the love has grown cold. And so it's this fascinating thing that now the story ends with the children of these two unions. Because in the first act, Andrew and Teresa loved each other. And he talks, and it's about their engagement. They're both reflecting on their engagement. But we find out in this scant story, there's not much of a story there, but that Andrew had to go off to the front and he dies after she gives birth to their son, Christopher. So he had never met his son, Christopher, but the love and the union of the two poured out into this little boy. So even though he never knew his father, his mother loved the image of his father that was still preserved in the son, in a non-creepy way, right? 
And so the boy, though he did not see his mother married to his father, was raised through that love that they shared. Whereas the girl, because their love had grown cold, was fearful of love, constantly fearful of love. So here is Andrew. <clears throat> so this, or this is the story of Andrew and Teresa on this page, right? <clears throat> the love of husband and wife. It always makes me excited when I introduce a new group of people to the jeweler shop. The jeweler shop is the name of the jeweler shop where they get their wedding rings. And at one point, I think Mo uh, not Monica, what's her name? Anna goes to pawn hers. I think she wanted to sell it back. And then in the other one, they, they're buying it. And the jeweler is essentially God. And he says, my scales have a particularity about them. They weigh not the weight of gold and diamond, but like the weight of man's sins. And <laughs> I remember when I was reading that, I read it to a friend. I was like, isn't that profound? And he's like, that is an interesting scale. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, you don't care. Okay. Now I understand not everyone's into, into poetry. You're stupid. Okay. <laughs> You're what's wrong with America. Get out. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Andrew has chosen me and asked for my hand. It happened today between 5 and 6 in the afternoon. I don't remember exactly. I had no time to look at my watch or catch a glimpse of the clock on the tower of the old town hall. At such moments, one does not check the hour. Such moments grow in one above time. But even had I remembered to look at the town hall, town hall clock, I could not have done so. For I would have had to look above Andrew's head. We were just walking on the right side of the market square when Andrew turned around and said, <coughs> Do you want to be my life's companion? That's what he said. He didn't say, do you want to be my life, but my life's companion. What he intended to say must have been thought over. He said it looking ahead, as if afraid to read in my eyes, and at the same time, as if to signify that in front of us was a road whose end could not be seen. There was, or at least could be, if I replied yes to his question. Whew. Okay, I didn't cry. Okay, got it. I'm going to tell you a story about why that's so emotional for me. I went a long way before reaching Teresa. I did not find her at once. I did not even remember if our first meeting was marked by a kind of presentiment. And I don't think I even know what love at first sight means. After a time, I realized she had come into the focus of my intention my attention. I mean, I had to be interested in her. And at the same time, I accepted the fact that I had to. Though I could have behaved differently from the way I felt I must, I thought there would be no point. There must have been something in Teresa that suited my personality. I thought much at that time about the alter ego. One of my favorite things. So she's sitting there and her whole notion is this, the significance of that moment being extended, that it, that it kind of pulled itself out of time, because that's what love does. For Andrew, for his whole experience of it, was this interplay between this human person that is mysterious, he calls her a distinct world, right? A world just as distant as any other man or woman. He said, but there is this thing that united them, that this urge, this connection that pulled him out of himself, but when he found himself in love with her, she was not this distant thing. She was an alter ego. She was another I. This is the beautiful thing that when two people fall in love and truly love one another, it goes beyond infatuation, beyond emotion. They become not just me and you, but one we, right? This new subject bound in love with one another. And I love that line, a whole world just as distant as any other man as any other woman. And yet there was something that allowed one to think of throwing a bridge, this notion of like, but I've got to cross this void between two worlds. I've got to build that bridge. The beautiful thing about the jeweler shop and this whole phrase, this whole thing, do you want to be my life's companion? That's how I propose to my wife, okay? Because I am very dramatic. <laughs> I'm a very emotional human being, right? So me and my wife had dated each other for about six and a half years. Uh, before we finally got engaged. And I had proposed to her about, 
kind of time to see. Okay. So what ended up happening was we periodically, I don't know if you were like this or are like this or knew someone like this, but I periodically broke up with her like I was in high school, right? You ever do that? You ever been a part of one of those relationships where you're just like, eh. So I broke up because I thought I was called to the priesthood. And every so often I would just feel this overwhelming pull to be like, sayonara, I got to go figure things out. I don't know how you can figure things out three or four times. In reality, in reality, it was just me being terrified of losing my freedom. Pope John Paul II said in a, uh, I think he was referencing America, when he said, we tend to put freedom as the highest value, subordinating even love to freedom. And that is a fear of so many men and women entering relationships is they're afraid to make the commitment. They'll play house, right? But we're afraid to make that commitment because what if, quote unquote, someone better comes along? And we're hemming our freedom in to just one person. And that terrifies people. Because for us, we have placed the virtue of freedom or the ability to have freedom or the value of freedom at the top as Americans. I mean, we totally have. And then subordinated to that is love. So love is great. Love is wonderful. Just don't let it limit you. Just don't let it imprison you. Just don't let it attach an old ball and chain to you, right? Like, these are the language that we use to describe commitment. And the amazing thing that I've discovered in marriage is that it legitimately, at least for me and my wife, that it gives you, yes, you are hemmed in in a very real way. When I said I do to Shannon, I said I don't to a whole bunch of other people, right? To all y'all. Sorry, ladies, but uh, all the single ladies. Okay, so we say I do. Every yes in marriage is an I don't to everyone else around the place, right? But there is this beautiful freedom now with this person who has said, I do to you till death, that you can finally and fully be yourself in front of that person because they're stuck. They are stuck in the eyes of God. And that's the, there is a beautiful freedom in that. When I, I mean, what, what is the line? I have bagged the game, right? No, like, there's just, there is this notion of now I can fully be myself. I can be naked without shame, like Adam and Eve in the garden, the primordial marriage, right? You know the story. Adam woke up married to Eve, right? He was alone. God cast him into a deep sleep. From his side, he fashioned his bride. Adam wakes up, sees the woman, and says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she came from her Ish in Hebrew. And then scripture says that the man, uh, that the man and the woman were both naked without shame. Why is that important? Because when you enter into the covenant of matrimony, right, you are giving yourself wholly over to this idea of love, right? Love is not just a feeling. It is the first feeling that erupts in the human heart. But it is not just a feeling. If the 80s have taught us anything, and they haven't, it's that love is more than a feeling. Okay. <laughs> so what I want to tell you is what is love. Don't, baby, don't hurt me. There it is. Okay, baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. Okay. How do we love as human beings? Our love is not spiritual. Our love is also physical. Our love is just as physical as it is spiritual. Right? How many of y'all ever heard of the five love languages? You ever heard of that phrase, handful of you? Right? Do you know what your five love language? What's your love language? Physical touch. Physical touch. <laughs> right? I have a buddy who's physical touch. And I'll tell you what. That's how he gives Right? So every time we're just hanging out, it's just, like, your hand on my shoulder. I'm like, what is happening? He's like, how's it going, bro? And I'm like, you're massaging my neck, right? I'm not saying that you've done that, but he's done that many times. So, okay, so what, what about, what is the way you receive love? Mm -hmm. Acts of service. Acts of service. Okay, so it's physical touch, acts of service, affirmation, quality time. Gift giving. Gift giving, gift giving. Gift giving. So it's it's just the ways that people give and receive love. What about you? You you've heard of it? Have you done it? Uh, words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, right? Yeah. Okay. That's how you receive it. How do you give it? Is it the same? Uh, acts of service. Acts of service. Nice, nice. Just for my little description, what do you think you are? If you've never, what? Are, oh, you said you heard it in the back. What what are you? Um, I receive quality time and I give attitude. You receive quality time. So you like quality time. And you do acts of service. What is like the most narcissistic one? Probably quality time, maybe? Or no, words of, I don't know what it would be. Whatever, I'm like, I'm like literally, they, they were looking at it, they're like, 
wow, you need people to tell you how good you are and to give all their time to you all the time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> and you can combine those two. That's what I am. My wife, my wife, the way she gives love is acts of service, totally. She's always serving people. And the way my wife hates to receive love is acts of service. Hates it, hates it. So whenever she, I mean, my wife is a doer. That's why I'm alive, is because she does the one. But the, uh, the, she hates it. She hates it when I do acts of service for her. In fact, one time we were at a, she was in a, a mom's group, and we had just had our second kid. And she's talking with these older women in this group. And they're like, wait, and she's complaining about me. And the ladies are like, wait, 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 wait. Your husband volunteered to do all the dishes, like clean the whole downstairs, and give the kids baths, and you're upset at him? And she's like, oh, when you put it that way, right? <laughs> I do sound like, like I'm awesome right now. So let me tell you why I'm awful. So while we were dating, while me and my wife were dating, I would break up with her periodically. It wasn't my fault. It was God's fault, right? So that's a that's a that's how, <laughs> that's how I would do it. See, you're you're discovering how dysfunctional I am as a human person. I can't even schedule a class correctly. So the whole uh, the whole thing unfolds. The whole thing unfolds, and I realize what a terrible mistake. And she comes up to me, and we get back together. Fine, great. We're dating for a couple more months, and she says to me, and she employs both of my like really good friends as the youth minister, director of the youth ministry in Sugarland, and I worked up here as the youth minister. And we're talking, and she comes, I'll never forget, she comes into my bedroom, we're in my apartment, she says, listen, we need to talk, like, I have to say this, like, I'm not asking for an engagement right now, but we have, we have to be pursuing marriage, like, we have to do this. She's like, I'm not saying we're going to get married this month, but we have to wake up and start doing this, and I'm like, I just don't think I'm ready, right? I said, I love you, I don't want to marry someone else. I just don't think I'm ready. It was some BS excuse like that, right? So we go back, like, she's like, she's, so she's crying angry tears, rage monkey tears, and she's like, if I get up and leave this room, we're done. And, I'm, and I just look at her, and I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I just can't do this right now. Like, I'm, what, what, because I had too much Xbox to play? Right, so she gets up and she leaves, and we're broken up, as if I was, I was still busy, right? And we break up, and it's done. It's over. And I remember looking at my, my friends, and they were playing Xbox. And I was like, guys, like, we just, I think we're done, done. So about a week later, I realized that was a mistake. But I didn't want to be Captain Flip-Flop, so I said, I'm going to spend a couple months, a month, yeah, a month, and I'm really going to pray, and I'm really going to figure this stuff out. Like, I'm actually going to discern and really pray and talk to priests and figure out my, my, what's going on, the mess in my head. So that when I don't do this back and forth with her anymore. So I finally square myself away. First time I saw her since that breakup, we were at a bar. Uh, what was it? Um, Richmond Arms down in Richmond in Houston. And we were there, big group of friends. And I said, hey, can I talk to you afterwards? Oh, no, we were across the street at, at uh, another place. Anyway, and so I was talking with her. It was funny because the next night when I tried again, we were at Richmond Arms. And I said to her, listen, can I talk to you afterwards? Everyone leaves. And she's like, what? And I said, I w you were right. I was wrong. I was just totally being a child, and I was afraid. And that's why I did it. And she said, and I'll never forget these words, now it's me telling you no. And she got up and left. And I was like, that's not, that's not how this is supposed to happen. <laughs> like, you're supposed to be like, oh, I've been waiting for you. Turns out she was a woman. Um, <laughs> which is probably why I wanted to marry her. And so she leaves the next day, and I'm like devastated. I was like, whoa, this, I thought she was going to be happy, complete, complete awfulness. So then uh, the next day, um, stuff at work fell apart. Like, I mean, I'm talking like World War III. I was done. I was ready to quit my job and walk out. And I had to do all this stuff, and I was so ticked off, and I get a phone call from my friend. Hey, everyone's going to meet at Richmond Arms tonight, which was, you know, we're here. It's down there. I get in my car, I, I, I go so fast, I think I, I broke the sound barrier, and I make it there in like 40 minutes, cutting through traffic, I don't know how I did it, but I'm there, and I'm like, hey guys, so casual, this is me being totally casual, how are you? And I'm just like staring at her the whole time, right? Long story short, she shoots me down like 15 more times that night, and I go back to my buddy, who is now my podcast host, Luke, and I just sob all night long, right? right. Now I'm a man. Not much of one, but I'm a man. 
And I know that there is no hope. I am devastated, right? It's awful. So then a few weeks later, it was my birthday. And a bunch of people were gathering at my buddy's house. He's becoming a priest here in a couple weeks. At his parents' pool. We're all hanging out, swimming. She shows up. Margaritas are flowing. I was like, hey, can I talk? This is my last ditch effort. And I pour it all out. All out. Shuts the door right in my face. And she just dumps it all out on me. And I'm like, that's how it's supposed to go. Right, so it was awful. <laughs> so she leaves. She leaves. So I'm devastated for like two weeks go by. And I call my spiritual director. And he says, Michael, Michael, the reason why she won't believe you is because you've said these words to her before. And I was like, yeah, maybe five times. What's the big deal? <laughs> and he says, you need to do actions that are louder than words. You need to go and tell her how much you love her. And this class is not about my engagement story. You need to go and tell her how much you love her. So he says, I'm nervous. I, I don't want to say this, but I think I should say this. You should go propose. And I said, that's funny. My best friend's wife told me that last night because I called everyone I knew. And uh, <laughs> so I go. He says, this is what I want you to do. For the next five days, I want you to go and make a holy hour in front of the Eucharist. Kneel down and do a holy hour. Pull out a journal and say, I am thankful for Shannon because, and write whatever comes out. He says, because the reason why you broke up with her, and broke up with her in the past, is because you lost your gratitude for her. And it's totally true. I took her for granted. So I sat down. I came up with this plan, right? This was my plan. And, I mean, he had good advice. He said, do one holy hour a day for five days. Instead, I, instead of doing it like this, I just kind of did it like this. So I went and called my mom. I said, Mom? She goes, what? I said, I need something from you. And she goes, oh, what? And I said, your engagement ring. My mom loves Shannon more than me. And I said, uh, your engagement ring. And she goes, it'll be ready for you. <laughs> like, like her voice changed. It was out of like a spy movie or something. <laughs> Right, so I fly and I walk, and she's literally in the front yard, just walking out. And I drive by, pick it up. She goes, "Good luck, baby. I'm praying for you." Good luck. So I turn around, I go to a Catholic bookstore, I buy three items: a rosary case of Our Lady of Guadalupe, because my wife has a devotion on it, uh, the jeweler's shop, and uh, a picture of Michelangelo's Holy Family. Okay, it's one of my wife had just. She had just randomly mentioned one time that was her favorite image of the Holy Family. So I bought it painted on wood. It was beautifully framed. Probably cost me a fortune. I don't know. And then I had a rosary. <laughs> I would just swipe in my credit card left and right. Uh, I, and then I had a rosary that I had in a CC that I got when I was over in Europe. And I wrapped, I took the rosary case of Our Lady Guadalupe. I put the engagement ring in the middle. And I wrapped the rosary around it, closed it. Now, you also have to realize one other thing. There is this thing called the Marian Consecration. And it is... Uh, Many, many days, several weeks, four weeks worth of prayer and preparation to do this thing called total true devotion or total consecration to Mary. So that was the day of the consecration. Now, I had found out, totally independent, that she was doing the consecration and I was renewing mine. And the last day was that day. She was on a retreat with some seniors, with my buddies. I told my buddies, hey, just if you're leaving, just tell me so I can go and meet up with y'all at the church, and they're like, oh, yeah, and then they totally forgot to call me, and they walk in the front door, and I'm like, you son of a, so I jump in my car, and I gun it to her apartment about 20 minutes away, stop off at Walmart, buy some roses, because I'm classy, and then uh, I go in there, I'm wearing a shirt from this uh, Irish Fest punk band that I love, that was, where we went and saw it together, I, like, every single thing on me was me, was all <laughs> devoted to the single purpose of woo, I was there to woo her back, right? <laughs> so I go up, and the gate, she has a four-story apartment with a four-story garage, and the gate doesn't open unless someone buzzes you in, and she had turned off her cell phone. So I'm dialing the thing over and over again, can't get in. A Suburban is coming out, and I gun it, and it realizes that I'm going out in through the out gate. So the guy throws it in reverse and tries to pin my car against the gates. I barely escape the dude. I fly up the four <laughs> things of, of, uh, of the... Um, the parking garage, and I get, I'm like, oh, oh, turn off all my lights, shut off the engine, I'm just waiting. Then I get out of my car, and I turn, I look, and I realize, crap, she has this huge metal security gate at the end of the hallway that blocks anyone from the garage area to get into the hallway, whether it's like the six or seven units. And I'm like, dang it. So I call her and call her and call her, nothing. So I walk up to the gate, 
and I pray what's called a memorare. It's a prayer. We call it the emergency prayer to Mary, right? Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided, right? So I pray this prayer, and I say, Mama Mary, you got to make a way. Right, now this is after I'd already done five hours of holy hours. There was a couple from Mexico City that were renewing their wedding vows. In the chapel, I was like, it's a sign from Jesus. I had underlined every passage in the jeweler's shop, every single one that I felt applied to our wedding, and I had written 14 pages front and back. I am thankful for Shannon because, 14 pages. So everything that was standing between me and winning her back was this damned security gate. And I pray the memorari. And I'm not kidding at all. There is zero exaggeration. I understand that I'm dramatic and I can have a tendency to uh, exaggerate. Not an exaggeration. My finger touched the doorknob. The metal doorknob attached to the metal security gate fell apart. Screws unwound and fell to the ground. The doorknob goes bing, boom on both sides and the gate goes I went, and I literally did this. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and I like pushed the gate open. I had this image of angels walking down the hallway, high-fiving, right? And, you know, doing all that stuff. There's probably some NBA theme song playing. Hey, do, 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 do. And I'm like, this is it. So I knock on the door. She opens the door and goes, Ugh. And I'm like, all right, not a good sign. So I go, I brought roses. And she's like, thanks. And just threw them on her kitchen table right next to the apartment. I was like, can I come in? So I didn't know this. So she just wanted a dang moment to herself. Spent all weekend on a senior retreat. Her roommate was out at a wedding. She had a few hours to herself. She had done the Marian consecration. Took a long, hot shower. And she was saying, one day of peace without anyone to remind me of Michael Gormley. Because her employees that she was doing the retreat with were my best friends and roommates. So everything of her life was surrounded by this face, right? So we sit down, and I propose to her. And it's very elaborate, but it's awesome. So I read her quotes from the book, and she's like, oh, you know, she's crying, and I got something in my eye. And then uh, uh, I give her the book, and I read passages out of it, and go for a whole relationship, and she starts crying. And I hand it to her, and I say, this is for you. And she's like, do I have to read the whole thing? And I'm like, you're so freaking funny. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, she, and then I pull out the image of the Holy Family. Now, my middle name is Joseph. Her middle name is Marie. And I give her the image, and I say, every Joseph needs his Mary. Come on, laughter? Not, <laughs> no, like, that was awesome. People were like, oh, right? Take that crap down, people, right? Uh, Every Joseph needs Mary, so I give it to her, and she, she immediately recognizes this is one of her favorite things and whatever. And I say, you know what? If you were to meet a guy tomorrow, he wouldn't know. He wouldn't have our history. He wouldn't know all this stuff. I said, for instance, that you love Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she's like, okay. And I said, I really wish I bought you something with Our Lady of Guadalupe on it. And she's like, yeah, me too. And she's being funny again, right? So I moved the bag that I had all this stuff, and it was this massive bulge sticking out of my thought. Sticking out of it, and uh, I reach in, and it, I pull out the rosary box, and I take a knee, and I open it up, and there's the engagement ring, and she's just wide-eyed staring. And I said, now, the Marian consecration prayer, I took and turned it into my proposal. And I said, Shannon Marie Rothkopf, right? What a terrible last name. I had to give her mine. You understand, right? I said, I choose you before the whole court of heaven this day to be my wife and my life's companion, right? Life's companion. So I say all this stuff, and I ask her, you know, whatever, will you marry me? And she starts crying and stuff, and I say, listen, I know this is too much. What I've done is awful. We were broken up because of me. I try to get back. I said, I know this is too much. If You need time. If you need an hour, I'll be like down the street. I'll be at the IHOP. Uh, if you need a day, a week, a month, all summer, just know I will give you whatever space you need. I won't tell my roommates. Give you whatever space you need, cause you, cause I love you, and I want to marry you. She thanked me. I get in the car, I drive away. Three days later, she calls me up. We meet. She gives me all the stuff back. Tells me no. Gets back in the car and drives away. Oh. Yeah. Right? How <laughs> dare she? See, when I tell the story, all the women in the room are like, "Oh, that's so romantic. Oh my gosh. Oh no, you 
Chris felt so bad. But when she tells her side of the story, literally, we did dueling stories where I finished my side, and they were all like, oh, you're so sweet. You're so lucky, Shannon. And then she tells her side, and they're like, oh, hell no. <laughs> right? And there's like bitch boards and torches. It's awful. So, <laughs> so fast forward. I called it the summer of hell. Right? It wasn't hell. It was purgatory, because in hell, there's no hope. Right? My friend would be like, Gorman, there's hope, okay? Don't worry, buddy. And he'd be like, you're only saying that. And he's like, no, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I go, yeah, there is, and it's an oncoming train, and it's going to hit me, and everything's over. And he's like, whoa, whoa. I was a little dramatic, right? Everything was awful. Everything was broken. But I'll tell you what, and this is 100% true, I have never prayed harder, more devoutly. More, and it wasn't, and this is what I realized. My prayer stopped being selfish. It stopped being about, Lord God, fix her to love me. It was, Lord God, whatever led me to walk away from a good thing, you need to heal that part of me so that I never do it again. So I become the type of man worthy of the type of love that someone like Shannon would offer. Devastating. Long story short, a young woman died, tragically, at Franciscan University, the school where I met Shannon. Uh, she was a cross-country trainer. They went up early, or a cross-country runner. They went up early to buy matching clothes and stuff at a sports store before the school year began and training began. And the car... ...basically like a second mother to this girl. So instead of calling their mom, all these people who heard about it, they would instead call Shannon's mom. Now, Shannon was visiting her mom at this time. And... Uh, and she flew down, we reconnected, and then we got back together. And uh, you ever heard the band Death Cab for Cutie? You ever heard of that band? Oh, such a good band. There's a Creeper song on there that I quoted to her when I reproposed to her on the golf course at a buddy's wedding. Hurricane Ike had come through, knocked out the air conditioning at the Augusta Country Club. So we were out, outside, beautiful, beautiful, cloudy day, wind flowing. And I looked at her and I said, Shannon, I am 100% sorry for everything I've done to you since we broke up. And I want you to know before you even say a word to me that I 100% forgive you for whatever way you had to self-medicate to deal with my stupidity. <laughs> and I said, I don't need to know. I don't care. I love you. And I just, and then I thought of the lyric. And I said, I will possess your heart. <laughs> <laughs> right? So cheesy. I am a human cheese ball. So... <laughs> You should have me a party. So, uh, yeah, so we did, we did that, and she said yes, and I kissed her, and 24 hours later, we had the hotel book, reception hall book, all this stuff book, and, uh, yeah, we got married. Got married after we both quit our jobs simultaneously, went back to Franciscan, finished our graduate degrees, her two months before the wedding, me a week before the wedding, and uh, we went and got married, and then I started a job two days later, so we've never had a honeymoon. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about marriage, shall we? <laughs> Uh, any questions? <laughs> any questions? <laughs> why are you so dysfunctional? That's a great question. That's a great question. The reason why I'm so dysfunctional is because I had been schooled in how to love, not necessarily by my parents, but mostly by pornography. Right? When I was six years old, I was first, first exposed to hardcore explicit pornography, older brother's older friend. His dad hid it from his wife by putting it in his son's closet. And it wrecked me. It ruined me. Why? Because it showed me that love did not exist outside of the physical, which is a lie. Okay, so what pornography does to us, it, it trains our hearts and minds to attach, to use, and to discard. To attach, to use, and to discard. And when you have enough young men and enough young women who are schooled in it, right, pornography can dominate the way you view relationships. There's this great line from this men's Christian men's book that was popular back in the day, of the guy said in this book, Wild at Heart, he said, I always wanted to play the night, I just never wanted to bleed like one. I mean, that to me is essentially what pornography does to men. It makes you feel like a man. Now, and I'm not saying that it doesn't do the same thing to women. Women, hear me, listen, I understand. The struggle is real too. Okay, I'm not one of those people that, oh, it's a guy's problem. I know, because I work with people all the time. I had to give a pornography talk to men's and women's high school students. I had priests, nuns, youth ministers, as well as teenagers from both genders come up to me and say, I have struggled or I do struggle currently with this, right? So I know, right? I'm not trying to shame anyone, but what I'm trying to do is relate a little bit of my experience. Pornography for men, at least for me, 
was this attempt to pretend to be a man without it costing me a damn thing, right? With that, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You play the night, but you don't bleed like one. For me, uh, marriage and pr- trying to recapture Shannon's love for me was a fear of regret because I had let pornography say, Gormley, this is too difficult. Walk away. Walk away. It's too difficult. It's asking too much of you. So when we look at this book by Carol Voitia, I love this book, Love and Responsibility. Love is in the title. Okay. Uh, this was a philosophical book before he penned this, which became the first five years of his pontificate, 127 catechesis at Wednesday audiences. Um, the theology of the body, male and female, he created them without the theology of the body. Now, I love this because this speaks to the skeptical heart. This speaks to modern man who is super rational. Theology of the body is for Catholics. But he contrasts love, which means to give of oneself to another. He says the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love in relationships is use because you depersonalize the other and you just use them. And so then he teaches us what is love? What is love? Okay. Now, right here, he says it starts with love. Authentic human love starts with the sexual urge, right? The sexual urge, this basic urge for sex, sexuality, all of that stuff. Why? He says because it is this interior force that pulls us out of ourselves, okay? At the very least, it is rooted deep within our biology. This sexual urge is important to understand because we are enfleshed human beings, he says, but the point of the urge, right, is it draws us out of ourself to. So think of throwing a bridge. This starts off as the sexual urge, a very physical thing. But then, for it to be love, a quality, a value, something within that person that attracts you to them. Love as desire, we will call this a value or a good, right? Something within them that draws you to them. Oh, she has beautiful eyes. Oh, he has one heck of a smile. He has an amazing beard. He's an incredible speaker. We love him the way he (laughs) sweats so much while he's talking, right? So all of this stuff, love as desire is, I see a good in you and that attracts me to you. Then we move on to the next one. For it to be love, it can't stop there. You can see how this quickly becomes use, right? This quickly becomes use. I see something of value in you, and I want it, right? That's good, normal, and natural if it keeps rolling, right? Like Limp Bizkit products. Keep rolling, rolling, rolling. Okay, so next is love at, no? Okay, love as attraction. These 90s pop culture references will keep coming, by the way. Okay. Love is attraction. Okay, now love as attraction. I don't know why I'm using two markers. Love as attraction doesn't just say, oh, that value, your smile, your bank account, right? I'm attracted to that, right? Love as attraction goes the next step and says, okay, so your, your beauty drew me to you. But now I've gotten to know the real you, and I see you as a good for me, right? Now, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. I see you as a person, as a whole, not just that value, but as a whole. You are good for me. We fit together. This makes sense. But if it's love, it has to keep going. Why? Because love is essentially an outward movement, and you're saying It's more of this inward thing. I'm drawing you into myself. I see you as a good for me. So then we come to the next stage. And I love this. I love this. This is the classical definition of love in the Catholic tradition. (sighs) Love as goodwill. What do I mean by that? Good in and of themselves, right? This is the ultimate expression of love, people. The ultimate expression of love is not, I see you as a good thing for me, but I want only what's good for you. Willing the good. And if you want to put in one fancy Latin word, volencia, 
Volens means will. It's where we get the word voluntary. Bene, bonus. It's where we get the word good. Goodwill. All right. I'm willing the good for you. That's the ultimate form of love. See, you notice that love as goodwill, okay, love as goodwill is the ultimate form of love and not any other kind because this is all about what you do for me. Not really you, authentically you, but it's still all about me until love grows to this point where you perceive the value of the other person so much that you just want good things for them. All right, that is love in its fullness. Love that wills the good for the beloved's own sake, right? That's why you have things like, you know, people breaking up with each other because you realize I'm not good for you, right? That's an expression of love. At least it could be, okay? could just be a convenient excuse. <laughs> Listen, baby, it's not you, it's me, right? I mean, we've heard that. It's a Catholic version. It's not you, it's not me. It couldn't be me. God, he wants us to be. Okay. <laughs> and I've used that before. Okay. So the sexual urge rooted in our physical nature orients us outwards. This desire to have sex, to be in love, to just the physical urge itself is a part of the dance of love. Right? But it doesn't even end here. This is the beautiful thing. It doesn't even end here. It continues. Let me erase this. This beautiful thing called reciprocity. What does reciprocity mean? Reciprocating? Reciprocal? Yep. Like a saw. It's a reciprocating saw. This is when you are willing the good for your beloved, and your beloved is willing the good for you in return. <clears throat> Reciprocal love is a phrase, I love this phrase, self-donating love. I give a gift of myself to you, you make a gift of yourself to me. Now, how does that love exist? Well, the whole point of this book, The Theology of the Body, is to show us that this whole thing takes place, minus the sexual urge, takes place within God. Why? What do I mean by that? Well. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 4, 16, God reveals something powerful. He says, God is love. You and I, we have love, but God is love. So what does that mean? I was telling my girls the other day, my daughter, Katiri, is working on uh, grammar and stuff, right? So we're going through spelling and different verb forms, and she's doing like past tense and stuff like that. And I tell her, I say, Kateri, I'm going to break, because my wife is using all these different sentences, and I said, let me, let me illustrate it this way. I said, this is actually what I use when I teach adults. And then that gets her so excited, because she's an old soul, right? So I say, I love you. Who is the subject? I. What is the verb? What is the action that I'm doing? Love. Who is the object? You. Like, the shortest sentence in the English language is, I am, right? Subject and the verb, right? And you don't need an object for that. I said, but love is one of those verbs that you always need an object. You can't just say, I love. Like, you see a, you know, eighth grader. <sighs> oh, you look like a young man who's in love. Who's a lucky lady? No one. See, if you don't love anyone, you know what you don't do? Love. <laughs> you don't love anyone. It's the same thing as saying, I don't, I don't love. Right? Like, that's the same thing. You can't just love. And, conversely, you can't be the object of that verb without a subject. Oh, you look like a man who's in love. What's the pretty girl's name? No one, right? Oh, wait, so you, you don't love anyone? No. Are you loved by someone? Yes. Who is it? No one. Right? That doesn't make sense. For love to be real, it has to have a subject and an object. This is the beautiful thing about St. Augustine's theology of the Trinity. From all eternity, God the Father had an object of his absolute, perfect, infinite, and eternal divine love, his Son. That's why he's called the Father, because he's eternally fathering his eternal Son. But in God, who doesn't have a body, right, how does that love originate? What is non-sexual love like in the Godhead? Well, number one, it's love is goodwill. It's self 
donating love. The father loves the son. He pours himself, he makes an entire gift of himself to the son. What does the son do? The son takes that gift. No, that's what we do. Because we're terrified of being alone and being unloved. So we take love from others. What does God do? He receives. Like Eve taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil instead of receiving the gift that God wanted to give her. So we have within the Godhead pure love. You have the lover who loves the beloved one. right? The lover and the beloved. The subject and the object. God the Son doesn't take, he receives the gift of God's divine, eternal, infinite love. And that love between the Father and the Son is so real, so intense, so eternal, so infinite, it's actually the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the bond of love uniting the Father to the Son. Think about that. The very bond of love from all eternity that unites the Father to the Son is the same thing you receive. In the Christian life. The power of the Holy Spirit. And just as the Father doesn't dissolve away into the Son, or the Son dissolve away into the Father, so too when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and in heaven, when you are fully united to God, you don't dissolve away into the divinity. We're not Buddhists, where we enter into annihilation of self. No. Because of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, who you are becomes deified fully united to God for all eternity. Who you are remains beautifully, wonderfully you, forever united to God. That love God made you and I in the image of. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, he says, let us make a man in our image, male and female, he created them. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, it is not good for man to be alone. Why is it not good for us to be alone? Because we're made in the image of a God who is not alone. And so for us to imitate God, Pope John Paul II would derive this notion of what he called the theology of the body. What does that mean? Theology ultimately means not just the study of God, but God's own inner life. What God reveals about himself is made known through our body. Now, how is that possible? When Adam saw the woman, he said, at last, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That their nakedness relayed some basic information about their union. Okay, so the Pope will call it, first they were created in the state of original innocence. Okay, this is what we call before the fall. Original innocence, man and woman had no sin. And thus, this process existed without lust. What is lust? Lust is the turning of a person... Right? Worthy of this, right, to just this or this. What do I mean by that? It takes a person and reduces them to an object of use. Instead of love, which says, I give myself to you, it says, I want to take something from you. That's what lust is. Lust isn't like being really excited about sex, right? This guy, what our culture says, right? This is like, oh, I'm so excited to have sex, right? That's not what lust is. Lust is where you view your beloved as nothing more than a collection of body parts for your own enjoyment. That's why the Pope said the reason why pornography is wrong is not because it shows too much. It's wrong because it shows too little. It only shows body parts and not persons. Okay? That's this movement of the heart that ends up when, when sin enters and lust enters, the fall enters. The love at the very core of man for woman, what happens when Adam and Eve eat the fruit? Right? What happens? What's the next thing after they eat the fruit and it says their eyes were both opened? What did Adam do? Huh? They realized they were naked. They realized they were naked, and then what happened? What were you saying? They tried to cover themselves. So my favorite part, right, is it says that they they try to cover themselves, and then they hear God coming saying, Where are you? Then Adam jumps into a bunch of bushes and hides. And then God says, God comes to Adam, and Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. See, isn't it fascinating that our fall from grace is tied so much to this sexuality notion? Why? Because Adam and Eve, before the fall, in original innocence, could look at the other in all their naked perfection, in all their attractiveness, in all their glory, and not reduce them to an object of lust. They could see one another and felt no shame. But the moment sin entered into that picture, shame came with it. 
and all of his friends. So what did they do? Think about this. They had to hide themselves with fig leaves. Where did they put those fig leaves? We all know where they freaking put the fig leaves, right? We all know where they put the fig leaves. One translation, I think it's the King James, says they made aprons for themselves. <laughs> Kiss the cook, right? So, uh, <laughs> it's so funny. We all know where they put the fig leaves, right? They covered their knees. No, we all know where they put them because we understand that there is something to do with the shame that they experienced in their nakedness. And the Pope would go on to say that their original justice, this original innocence, and the original union symbolized by naked without shame, by that language, naked without shame, that was lost. And now the man could look at the woman completely naked and see her as a bunch of body parts for his personal use and enjoyment. And so she felt ashamed at the look and had to cover her nakedness to prevent her from being used. This is the Catholic understanding of what we call modesty. Unjustly born over the ages by women alone almost, right? High school youth group. These are what women are not allowed to wear. This is what men aren't allowed to wear, right? When it comes to modesty, right? Unjustly burdened, women unjustly burdened down through the ages with modesty. What, but what is the essential core of modesty? The essential core of modesty is I'm going to cover up my body parts, not because I'm ashamed of them, but because, Pope uh, John Paul II would say, it's a defense mechanism. Because I'm ashamed of what you will do with your eyes and your mind to my body with my body, as an object of use instead of an object of love, right? And so think about this, the man and the woman, in the moment sin entered the picture, put up a barrier between the only other person who was literally made for them. Think of the loss in the fall, right? Think of that loss, that God literally made Eve for Adam and Adam for Eve. And in the fall, they lost that. They had to hide and protect themselves from one another, setting up a barrier of self-defense. Now this prehistorical moment before the fall is what Jesus Christ references in Matthew 19. Open your Bible to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I got dressed in the dark today, just so you know, and I grabbed my blue pants thinking they were my gray pants, and then I grabbed my blue shirt knowing it was my blue shirt, and I was driving on the way to this retreat, and I looked down, and I was like, oh, I'm all blue. Okay. Going monochrome today. So I apologize if that offends you. 19. Nine times. As a Ferris Bueller said, I'll It's okay. <laughs> well, that's part of that movie. Not all of it. Oh, I love all of it. Every inch of it. We could get a nice TV and a bar. Okay, anyway. Let my Cameron go. All right. 19. Who's going to read for us? Oh, the, huh? <laughs> chapter 1, or chapter 19, verse 1. Now, when Jesus had finished the, the saying, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Stop! The region of Judea beyond the Jordan was where John the Baptist's ministry was set up. Why was John the Baptist killed? Why was he beheaded? Because he called out Herod for marrying his brother's wife. Yeah, he forced his brother to divorce his wife and then forced her to marry him. So she wanted to marry him because he was the more powerful one. John the Baptist called him out on it, mocked him, he was imprisoned, and then weird dance ends up his head on a silver platter. So now, let's set the stage. Matthew 19. Jesus is in the same area where John the Baptist was doing his ministry. Continue. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking... Okay, stop. Why are the Pharisees there? They are... Nasty people. Nasty people. What does the text say? Tested him. Tested him. They aren't there to get his theological opinion on a debate between Jewish rabbis Hillel and Shammai. Police. So many Catholic Bible interpreters say that. They are there to test him, to trap him. Why? Because they want to destroy him and discredit his ministry. So they ask him a question, hoping the Herodians are listening. Now listen to this question, knowing what you know about John the Baptist. Go on. 
Is it lawful to divorce one's wife uh, for any cause? Pause. For any cause. Do you think any Jewish person believed that a man could divorce his wife for any cause? He's just walking down the street. Oh, look, it's a noon. You're divorced. But that's the type of legal claim you need to fit what Herod did into this thing. Continue. He answered, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one, become one. So they are no longer two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Is okay, pause. I know, I know. I was letting you go. There's a couple times I was going to throw it out there. <clears throat> what was Jesus' response? Verse 4. He answered, have you not read? Okay, he's talking to Pharisees. They're not allowed to be Pharisees unless they have the first five books of Moses memorized. So that's like walking up to an ACLU lawyer and saying, have you ever heard of the freedom of speech? He is mocking them with holy sarcasm. Okay, <laughs> have you not read the first couple chapters of the first book of the Bible? Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Now, notice his appeal. Have you not read that he, God, who made them, male and female, from the what? Beginning. beginning. This whole thing, this book, every single thing in this book is a meditation. Well, I should say, the first half of this book is a meditation on those words. What Jesus is saying is, okay, we're going to get into some mosaic law. We're going to get into this stuff, but I want you to know something. God's standards is not mosaic compromise. God's standards are before sin enters the picture. From the beginning. God's original plan. Continue. If you remember where you were. Uh, verse 7. They said to him. Yo, oh, that's all you. Oh, you girl. Shoot. <laughs> Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? He said to them, for your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you... Stop right there. And I say to you... He's literally speaking in the voice of God. This is pure authority. Continue. Uh, where am I? He said, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay. Now listen to the heaviness of these words. According to the Mosaic Law... If a man were to divorce his wife, he had to issue a certificate of divorce. Hillel and Shammai de debated one another as to what were the causes that a woman could divorce a man, or, or rather a man could divorce a woman, right? Some would say, oh, only in extreme cases like adultery. Other ones say, oh, no, 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 no. If, one, if he burns your breakfast, you can get another one to make it lunch or something, right? That's literally a quote. Now, what did Jesus say? They appealed to Moses... In the book of Deuteronomy, Deuterosinomos means the second law. And Jesus doesn't appeal to Moses in the second law, which is a concession to a hard-hearted Israel. Remember, the, the Deuteronomy is not given on a mountaintop at Sinai. Deuteronomy is the compromise given to the second generation on the plains of Moab right before they enter the Holy Land. It's the exact opposite type of location. It's an old, wise lawgiver realizing who his audience is. And instead of saying, listen, you're going to kill her, I'd rather you just divorce her. That's what Jesus means by the phrase, the hardness of your heart. Why then did Moses say, give her a certificate of divorce to put her away? He said to them, for your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Now, what's the next sentence that he says? Or the next line? But from the beginning but from the beginning it was not so now the roman catholic church would never say this this is a hard and difficult saying right this is the thing why people hang up on my um, on me when we're doing rcia stuff right this is a burden that we carry jesus viewed the sacrament of matrimony as for life only in death do you part it's a pretty big deal and he says, if you divorce, you're forcing her to commit adultery. Why is that? You guys know why that is in the Old Testament? Because women weren't allowed to be employed. Right? There was very few things that a woman could do to sustain a living. Prostitution. It's pretty high up there. right? But even more so, typically, if a woman was divorced, her family, she would move back home to her family, and her family would immediately try to give her away to a secondary marriage. Right? 
And so Jesus is saying, no, you're joined. God joined you. Let no man put asunder what God had joined together. Okay, that's what this phrase. Now, note the phrase of the disciples. Verse 10. Start, keep reading for verse 10. Um, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. How crazy is that? They're like, really? I have to be with one woman forever? <laughs> well, it would be better not to get married. <laughs> That's literally their response. Now note Jesus' response, verse 11. Uh, but he said to them, Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been sold from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Okay, now. <coughs> what is a eunuch? Does anyone know? Right? Does anyone watch Game of Thrones? The unsullied. <laughs> Some are unsullied. Okay, so a eunuch is someone who cannot have sexual intercourse. A man who's a member, it's been chopped off. Usually it's chem uh, castration, right? But eunuch typically refers in what Jesus is saying. He's saying there are so those who have been eunuchs by others, which means typically in a war, right? The defeated army, some of them will become eunuchs and thus slaves, strong men who now cannot have sex. You put them in charge of the royal harem. Right, the royal wives and concubines and all that stuff. Because you know, no funny business is going to happen, but at the same time, strong like bull, right? Or at least they were. Um, and then he says, there are some who are eunuchs by nature, or who have been made eunuchs since birth, right? That's just a birth defect, right? Prevents them. And then Jesus says, there are eunuchs who are so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, he doesn't mean people who chop off their junk. That's not what Jesus is saying right here in this statement, because what he's talking about is the disciples' phrase is, well, then it's expedient to, rem to not to marry. It'd be better to remain unmarried, is what they're saying. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Not all can receive this. But there are some who are given the gift of being eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God, of being unmarried for the sake of the kingdom. Okay. Now, in this one chapter, you have the church's understanding of celibacy, and you have the church's understanding of marriage. Now, I need to express some basic truths, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to pass out the papers for RCIA folks who are going to enter the church on the 13th, right? All you adult confirmation folks can leave, but we're going to go through the rite itself, and then we're going to be done, and we're going to do the uh, rehearsal, actually, on Sunday morning. I want you to be out front at 10 a.m., and we're going to do a walkthrough at about 10, 15, 10, 20 in the church. Yeah. And then in that passage where yeah. um, he says, except for unchastity, yeah. he's alluding to all these, like, Marriages of close relations or something right like that, correct? I mean, not somebody being unchaste, but marriages that were unchaste, you know? Sexual. So the, the phrase can be divided into like two or three different ways, the phrase unchastity. The word is literally porneia, mm -hmm. where we get the word for pornography. So the first could re, uh, imply adultery. So adultery is such a wound of the marriage bond that it might sever the marriage bond. Some of the church fathers felt that way. It wasn't unanimous. But the woman or man was not able to remarry, but they could be divorced. Okay. The next phrase is this Levitical notion. That's why the word is often translated as unchastity. The Levitical law says, you know, let, if you find out your, uh, you know, brother and sister, you can't, you can get divorced immediately. You know, I don't know if you know this, but in America we do that. If someone is too close blood relations, the state steps in and forcibly divorces them. So there have been adoptive kids who have done research, who have found out that they are actually brother and sister. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah. Think of the odds, people. Think of the odds. Two cases, one in the U.S., one in Canada, happened almost at the same time. Found out they were blood relations, state comes in, divorces them, right? Uh, except for unchastity means except where unlawful unions exist. That is a Levitical view. Um, in Acts chapter 15, there's some evidence of this where they talk about uh, Gentile Christians are to abstain from blood of animals and unchastity, and it kind of referring to this Levitical understanding. Um, in other ways, uh, in the New Testament, it's translated as immorality and not just adultery. So it has a wider meaning than just adultery, but its common meaning is, you know, sexual sin. So it's, it's something having to do with sexual sin. There's another view, but I think it's weird, so I'm not even going to bring it up. But it's called the no comment view, that Jesus is just like, eh, except for this other category over here that I'm not even going to talk about moving on. Yeah. I think that's weird. But uh, that is a, a, a view that people hold. So what is the Catholic Church's teaching and understanding about sex within marriage, right? So usually when I teach this class, 
I don't talk about all the lovey stuff. I don't talk about all this. Uh, because no one wants to know this, because we think we understand what love is. We think we understand that love is a desire that I feel for my beloved, which is why often when we write our own vows, our wedding vows are about the love we have now for one another and how pure and wonderful and snowflake it is, right? When in fact, when the church gives us vows, these vows are pledged to the future, right? What are the vows of the church when you're in marriage? Huh? Yeah, you're saying it. Yeah, in sickness and in health, for richer for poor. You're not saying, may I become sick if I break this covenant. No, you're saying, regardless of whether I'm sick or healthy, whether we are rich or poor, whether we are better or worse off, I love you, I'm staying here, you know, whatever. So when I got married to my wife, Father Tom did the vows, I think I shared this, my wife stood up on the altar and said, for richer and for poor. <laughs> on the altar, my wife literally did that. Gosh. Words, right? So vows are a pledge of future love. When things get difficult, I promise I'm here for you, right? So what is the Catholic view of sex? This is usually what I do when I write up on the board whenever I talk about this, right? Sex is between a male and a female. Who are married? One another. Okay. Let me throw in. Well, you know, today, we don't really know that. Okay. Now, why is this important? Because this is the union that generates life. This is the union that has always, in every culture in the world, regardless of whether cultures demand that all sex be this, which is pretty much a Jewish thing, right? Homosexual sex acts were practiced by the Greeks, by the Romans, given approval, all sorts of people, all sorts of uh, cultures in the ancient world, except the Jewish people. The Hebrew Bible has always, from the beginning, to right now, has always and forever said, male and male, female and female, sexual relationships are viewed as uh, violating God's plan for human sexuality. Okay? And you have to understand this. This doesn't mean that we hate gay people. It doesn't mean that... Actually, I actually have two very, 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 very good friends, you should support them on Patreon, who are bisexual. They are amazing people, these two women. They are amazing. They have a ministry called Eden Invitation. Like I said, you should support them on Patreon. But um, the church has always said that sex is only to be done within marriage. Only to be done. It's like fire. Fire is great. Keeps warm, cooks your food. When fire is in a fireplace, it does wonderful things. Taken out of context, right? Fire on your coffee table, you got a problem, right? Sex is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Sex, according to church teaching, actually makes you holy. Did you know that? Sex is an explicit act of holiness. It's not just mm -mm good, like Campbell's soup, right? <laughs> it's not just great, like Frosted Flakes. Sex is an explicit act of holiness. When two people are in love, expressing their love for one another, they will the good for their beloved, even in sex. So what we have is a culture that has gotten rid of the true nature of love as willing the good for one's beloved, and has replaced it for just love as attraction, right? I see you as a good thing for me, right? And disregarding all of human tradition has now understandably opened up, or actually by opening up the understanding of marriage has destroyed the very meaning of marriage, which is a couple united together, ordered towards children. Ordered towards means you might not have kids, but you are ordered towards having children. This is very important from the Catholic Church. If you have sex with someone who is married but is not your spouse, you are committing adultery. If you have sex with someone who is not your spouse and neither of you are married, you are fornication. It's a big fancy old school word, right? No one uses that word except they're being silly. Fornication, right? So premarital sex, extramarital sex, right? All of that, all of that is viewed as unchastity by the Catholic Church. So then we ask, what the heck is chastity? Chastity is not the repression of your sexual desires, right? Because we just saw how the Pope rooted human love in our sexual desires. Chastity is a virtue. It's not abstinence. How many of y'all went to youth group when you were in high school and you had a, like an abstinence card and a purity ring and you signed those things? None of you? Would you not race in the South, people? Um, I, I can remember like having my chastity card and like, ah, same sex for marriage, right? High five, we're straight edge. Um, 
Chastity chose us. Uh, <laughs> this, this whole notion, this whole notion of uh, of abstinence. What is abstinence? Abstinence is saying no, right? That is not the Catholic view of chastity. Chastity might involve a no, right? As Winston Churchill said, your no is only, or your yes is only as good as your no. If you have an inability to say no, what the heck does your yes mean? And that yes might be in the form of two words, I and do. What does your word mean if you have an inability to control yourself? Chastity is not the repression of your sexual desires. It is, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the successful integration of your sexual desires. That is what chastity is. Some of us choose to no longer be chaste because we are terrified of being alone. And our culture has wholesale embraced this worldview that sex is no big deal, which is funny because if it's no big deal, why is it on the cover of every magazine? Because when you don't have mutual self-gift, all you have left is technique. When you don't have true committed love, all you have left is technique. 17 ways to curl his toes in bed tonight, right? 100 ways to have sex with her in an amazing way. <laughs> it's called being creative, people. Uh, you want me on your marketing team. Um, but no, right? You see these things over and over again, right? We say, oh, sex is no big deal, and yet it's on the cover of every magazine, right? It's constantly shoved in front of our faces because sex is powerful. That's why sex sells. It is very powerful. That's why porn makes more money than the NFL and the NBA and, of course, than the NHL because only weirdos like my wife watch hockey, okay? <laughs> sex sells because it is powerful, because it speaks to the very core of who we are in this whole notion of life-giving love. When a woman rejects a man and a man gets all fussy, right? I have this friend, she talks about how, you know, like she'll be at a bar and some guy will buy her a drink and she'll be like, thanks, and then she won't ever talk to him. And he'll be like, uh, are you gonna come over? And she'll be like, no, I don't owe you anything. And he'll be like, you stupid b -word, right? And they freak out. Why? Because rejection is essentially the equivalent of saying, I don't think you deserve to be to have someone mate with you and continue your lineage on through generations. Like that is what rejection is in a real way when it comes to this love. Like we think, oh, I'm just having fun, blah, blah, blah. Friends with benefits benefits no one. Why? Because you're mutually using one another. You're mutually entering into an arrangement where you say to your beloved, I'll use you and you'll use me as if we are married, even though we're not. And so you might say, Michael. In our culture today, this is unrealistic. This is idealistic. This is pie in the sky stupidity. And I'll say to you, in the eyes of the world, it is. But I'm not calling you to enter into the world. I'm calling you to enter into the very heart of the blessed trinity. And this is the divine life. This is what it means to embrace another. Totally, freely, fruitfully, for the future. So when we look at all the do's and the don'ts that involve Catholic sexual practice, right? Let me give you a couple, couple rules. Number one, the church grants great freedom in foreplay, right? I love that I said that so loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, what, what are they talking about? You know. Um, the church grants great freedom in foreplay, but foreplay is not sex. Foreplay sets the stage for sexual activity, right? The man and the woman in this book. Carol Voitia, the celibate man, talks about orgasm. And he talks about the... Enjoy your Bible study. Uh, <laughs> he talks about how it is unjust for a man to orgasm without making sure the woman does. Right? Like that is a this is an act of love and not just love but almost but but justice. And he talks about this mutual self-giving love. The beautiful thing that emphasis and overemphasis on technique misses is that when you are in love and you are giving yourself in love, you are willing, even in the act of sex, you are willing the good for your beloved. And sure, it I mean this might sound super romantic. Listen, I've been married for almost 10 years. It is not always this beautiful, romantic thing, right? 
But it is always within the covenant of matrimony an expression of love. Or at least it should be. At least it should be. Because if I am somewhat chaste, then that means that my yes to her in the act of making love is a yes of my whole body and soul. It's what we call betrothed love. It is a physical ratification of the verbal covenant we made at the altar. What is sex? Sex is the ratification and renewal of the covenant oaths that we swore at the altar. When I said, I do, to you, I said, all that I am is yours, and all that you are is mine. I'm giving myself to you. That's why my ring says in Hebrew, I am my beloved's and he is mine. It is mutual self-donation, not use, not use. So here's the difficult part, okay? Now, you have this handout, all this stuff, the vocation of chastity. This is all required reading. Love of husband and wife, fecundity in marriage. I love that word, fecundity. The first t-shirt I ever made said, I spread fecundity. It was a picture of a man with a cane and a top hat. It's fine. It's dumb. I never, no one ever bought one, but that's fine. Uh, fecundity is just such a fun word. Are you fecund? Right? It just means fruitfulness in marriage. Right? In the Roman Catholic Church, you are not allowed to use contraception when you engage in sexual intercourse. You are not allowed to intentionally sterilize yourself as a man or a woman. For some reason, every single person that goes to this church who has done that procedure has told my wife. <laughs> it's like, just, hey, you know, I got my tooth tied just last week. And my wife's like, hi, I'm Shannon. I don't, like, it's like the first thing people leave with. My neighbor, I was like, hey, how you doing? Welcome to the neighbor. And he's like, hey, I saw you have kids. I got two kids and snip, snip. And I was like, oh, we are best friends now. Let us get a beer together. <laughs> now, what does the church say? If you have already been... Uh, you already done one of these procedures. The church does not require you to reverse it, right? That's an undue burden, right? But the church says very clearly, you have to be open to life. Now, the beautiful thing about a woman's body, among other things, is that she is not perpetually fertile, right? So within the cycle of the woman is built in times of fertility and times of infertility, right? I don't know if you're aware of that. If you are not aware of that, Oh, how the public school system has failed us all, right? But there is this notion. Now, this is the beautiful thing about natural family planning, NFP. How many of y'all went to the NFP classes in preparation for things like the convalidation or marriage or anything? No, no, no. Yeah! Bam! One. Okay. NFP, natural family planning, is not the old rhythm method. I got rhythm, I got rhyme, I have 400 children, right? It's not the old rhythm method. The church teaches that you have a responsibility to the children you produce. That there is a just reason to space children. We are not all called to be Catholic rabbits, as, as Sergeant Fury said in uh, Avengers 2 Age of Ultron. Okay, we are not all called to be Catholic rabbits, right? What are we called to do? Intelligently, right? intelligently space the birthing of children, but to be generous in having kids. That's what the church says, right? Yeah? I have a question. Um, what, do you, what would you say to someone who says NFP is kind of similar to... Is Catholic contraception? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Get it all the time. NFP, abstaining from sex during fertile periods and engaging in sex during infertile periods so as to... Uh, not have kids, not achieve pregnancy, whatever. What we say to them is simply this. Number one, it is still the same sexual act that is open to life. It is still open to life. But even more than that, it doesn't replace technique, which is what a condom does, right? With vir or replace virtue with technique. And what I mean by that is the man must have self-mastery over his desires to abstain for a short time while she's fertile. So what that does is it forces the man to show his love in non-sexual but still intimate ways. So, for instance, there was a woman in a class I was teaching. I was a youth minister here. She was very, very pro-contraception, which, listen, if y'all are using contraception, the church says you cannot receive Holy Communion if you're doing it. Can't, it, is, it is a big deal. But I just want you to know, don't freak out right now because this has been your practice and the first time you're hearing about it, right? Read, research, give me a call, talk about this stuff. This, this should not be the end of the line for you if you have more questions. It is okay to have a lot of questions. It is okay for you to be right now in your head saying, freaking hate this guy and everything he's saying. That's normal if this has been your practice up till now and you never heard this. Okay, so the woman says to me, 
you know, blah, blah, blah. She's asking me these questions, and she said, what, what, what is the difference between NFT? I said, NFT is always open to life, and it respects the woman's body. And I said, and even more so, it causes the man to be virtuous. And she says, what does that mean? I said, I have to love my wife in a non-sexual way, but still in a romantic way. I have to show my love for my wife in a non-sexual way, but in a romantic way. This woman, now this, is, this might not be all, but she started crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, because in 17 years of marriage, my husband has never touched me in a romantic way without it purposely leading towards sex. And, I, and she said, I realized, and this was her words, the poverty of my love. Now, and I said to her, right, this is the thing, right? St. Paul specifically talks about refraining from sexual intercourse for a season, right, so that you can have this self-control. And he says, and then you come together in a mutually agree upon time or something funny like that. But this notion of built into NFP, when you are remaining, when you need to space children, like for my wife's health after she had her third kid, it's all C-sections for us, right? My wife's body does not go through labor normally, so they're all C-sections, which does a massive amount of damage to a woman's body. So you have to let her recover, let her recuperate, all that stuff. So that is a just reason why we shouldn't seek out to have more kids, let her body heal, all of that stuff. But within that, there's an abstinence. There is a marital abstinence or marital chastity within that whole thing. That is difficult. That is difficult. But I don't know if you guys know, but love is actually very difficult. <laughs> to love another person does not just happen, right? It doesn't. You have to work at it to will the good of the beloved. So the reason why it's not... Now, some people can use a contraceptive in a way where you're saying... Essentially, I just don't ever want kids, and I'm going to use NFP as a way to never have kids. That violates what the spirit of the law of what the church is teaching, right? You have to be open, generous, right? You have to do this stuff. But at the same time, the very act itself is not a barrier between you and your beloved. You're not saying, you're not removing entirely the baby aspect of love making, which is babies and bonding. It's about uniting the two and about generating life, right? So you're not direct contraception. I mean, you couldn't get a better word. The word contra means against, okay? So that's pretty heavy, what I just said. That's pretty heavy. Now, if you don't know where you stand on this stuff, or you know where you stand, and it's somewhere else of what I'm saying, we need to talk about this more. There's a lot more, and a lot smarter people who have written about this stuff. I have a bunch of books in the back. Some of the stuff talk about it. I have some books up here. Pretty great stuff. Um, the whole theology of the body was written because in 1968, Pope Paul VI, wrote a document called Humanae Vitae. He was reading this book when he wrote that document, Humanae Vitae, on human life. The day it was published, hundreds of theologians stood on the steps of Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and they protested the document. It almost divided the church in half, so Pope Paul VI never again spoke out on contraception. It was a heavily divisive issue because the pill being invented in the late 50s caused the sexual revolution of the 60s. Pope John Paul II elected, <laughs> Pope Paul VI died, Pope John Paul I died, and Pope Paul VI elected all within the same month, right? When he was elected, he spent the first five years of his pontificate talking about this, addressing from a positive way the theology of the body, man's self-donating love to his beloved. It's a huge, it's a 300-page argument that gets to the last chapter. The last chapter is on contraception. 300 pages to lay the groundwork and the theology of how your body uniting with your spouse's body actually tells something of the glory of God. Right? That's the theology of the body. Now, I sent you all in a previous email a whole bunch of talks that I've given. I have a whole series that I do every summer, almost every summer, called The Theology of the Body Week, where we spend an hour and a half to two hours on each of these like major subjects. We deal with transgenderism, homosexuality, all that stuff, right? Because these are hot topic issues the church never talked about until, oh my God, it's out of control. Right, so all these things, people also don't understand the profound amount of thought that the church has behind these things. They only know the what, not the why. So that's why we have to take time and go through this. Okay. Uh, any questions about sex? Children? No? <laughs> I just realized it's been filming my ear the whole time. Oh, you like that? You like that ear? Probably. <laughs> It's getting my thick side beard and the calic right here. That makes me anything. Uh, so, um, okay, so this is the last class. For adult confirmation, we are looking to secure this room for next week. 
so that we could kind of do a run through of the right. We don't do the right, remember, for adult confirmation, for you non prots, okay? For you who are Catholic, who have baptized Catholics seeking adult confirmation, that's done at the diocese, by the diocese, by hopefully the cardinal, because he's awesome. Um, that's not done here. But it's all handled by the diocese. So if you haven't gotten an email from them, have you gotten emails from them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know your location? No? Okay. You haven't gotten an email? I think I have to do some emails. <laughs> 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 I'll let you know. <laughs> God is here. Um, okay, so that is all being done. So hopefully I can secure a time where we can just walk to the right. The right is so easy. It is so beautiful and easy. Okay, adult confirmation people, you're more than welcome to stay. Actually, the right that we're going to go through is uh, here. Everyone else, go. Uh, just the person getting... Uh, coming into the church next week, we have the documents right back there by my backpack that looks like a suit. Uh, right back there. And we're just going to walk through. It's super easy. We'll be done before nine. I promise we'll be done before nine. Maybe. So non Catholics are staying here? Non Catholics who are becoming Catholics stay here. You can take the paper, but you don't need the paper. Yeah. Because the paper actually has the right of confirmation. Yeah. And you'll email us back next week for our rights. Yes, yes. All right, hey, guys, don't make a difference. So don't I'm, make a difference. I'm going through the process. Yes. It's going to be... Fun, day. exciting, <laughs> wonderful. The second it's done, so we'll hook you up with the last time I will see you for this memorial? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you're a dull confirmation, you should come Sunday at 11 and support your fellow classmates. But, um, My pleasure, yes. But you're, I mean, obviously you're I'm, welcome. Yeah, to working with Elizabeth yeah. then. Nice. Yeah. And the moment it's done, you just let me know, okay. and we go and, and do a right for you. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, you should go your confession before confirmation? Yes. Yes, I should send out an email about that. I don't know. Uh, Saturday morning at 8.30, 8.30 I think, maybe 9. Okay, and you're yeah. open at tomorrow? Tomorrow night at? 6.30. 6.30. Okay. Yeah, and there you go. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow night's a better option than Saturday morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you can't do it tomorrow night, look up St. Simon and Jude, um, or call, make an appointment. They're always available. All right. Good deal. My problem is because I'm not going to be going through next week. I have paperwork to do. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was answering the first sister. What paper? What paper do you have? Yeah. Okay. Sister Frank. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Oh yes. All right. Is it hot in her, or is it just me? <laughs> so is your name not on here? Does that mean you don't do this? No, no. That name, that list was from 2017. <laughs> I just grabbed the last time I did that and printed it off because we haven't printed off. Okay, now. It's just one page, front and back. Ain't nothing scary. Ain't nothing scary. Although for you, because we're dunking you. Okay. We're going to have happen at the time by? Uh, okay, Father Tom still hasn't gotten back on that. Yay! So it might be later. I'm hoping it's at the same time. Okay. But that's the drama that we live with. And I just recorded that on YouTube. <laughs> I ain't no shame. Oh, you're good. You're good. <clears throat> right of reception. Max is at 11 a.m. I want you there at 10 a.m. to check in with us. Mass will probably end at 10.15 a.m. from the 9 a.m. Mass. It usually ends around 10.15. Church clears out. We go in. We are going to reserve a pew for your family. You tell us how many people are going to be there. Some people, it's just two people. Some people, it's 4,000 people. Okay, so however many you have coming, just let them, not me. Because I'm a disaster. Let Mary Beale know. M. Beale at ap.church. Tell her how many people are coming. Now what's going to happen, okay, is we are going to do probably two walkthroughs during, or right before Mass starts. So around 1020, and then again at like 1040, okay? Just so you feel less stressed about this whole thing, okay? The right of reception. None of this is any different from any other Mass until after the homily. So you good. You just chill out. 
Don't feel anxious about a thing, right? That's the thing is I always try to get people to let that anxiety of being kind of upfront in front of people, just let that go away. You're going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with each other. You're going to have your buddy behind you supporting you. You're good. You're good. <clears throat> so the deacon will call the candidates, you fancy people, with your sponsors. So you'll be sitting on the end of the pews near the center aisle. And you, when you hear your name, you stand up, you step out, you walk forward, you bow together, and then you go to the assigned place that Mary will have for you around the foot of the altar. Okay. Now, I have done inclusion, right of receptions. This is now my seventh time, I think. Right? Super easy. I'm not worried about it. But that's probably why I haven't shared too much information to you, <laughs> because it's easy for me. Now, listen to the words of the priest. So you'll all be standing there with your heels touching the steps, facing forward, looking at the massive amount of eyeballs looking at you, judging you. <laughs> and the priest will say, everything that we say depends upon sufficient consent. Okay? Everything we say. So when you go to get baptized, they say, Why, what do you ask of the church? You say, baptism. Of your own free will, are you here to get baptized? You know it, and you high-five each other. This is like marriage vows. So you make sure that the person entering knows why they're here. Of your own free will, you have asked to be received into the full communion of the Catholic Church. No pressure, y'all. You feel pressured, tell me. We won't do this. Okay? Except for you. You have to. Uh, <laughs> you have made your decision after careful thought under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and his bearded avatar. I now invite you in the presence of this community to profess the Catholic faith. In this faith, now think about these words, in this faith you will be one with us for the first time at the Eucharistic table of the Lord Jesus, the sign of the church's unity. And then you all respond together in unison. I believe. I believe. It's written on your paper in bold. Boo, you suck. If I were in the pews, I would I would literally yell, boo, you suck. If that's what it is. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna do it for you. And then you just you just watch. Let me imitate it. Or let me do it and you imitate it. I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes, teaches, and proclaims to be revealed by God. Now, let me take away some anxiety. You should memorize this, but we will also have cheat sheets that'll be palmable. It is so funny when you have a group of people and they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, believe and profess. I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes, teaches, and proclaims to be revealed by God. Do you hear how heavy this freaking statement is? That is a heavy statement. You are saying, right, that I believe in the church. That's huge. I do not want you up there if you cannot say this phrase. That doesn't mean it's the end of your journey. It means it's when we start journeying together in a different way, right? Jesus Christ desires boots on, eyes wide open, marching straight in to his church. If you have hesitancies, fears, doubts, worries, anxieties, do this. Cover the stuff. You don't have to come into the church if, you're, if you can't feel like you can say this with all integrity. You don't have to come into the church now because we have other inclusion classes and other people who need their marriage convalidated that will do this right again in the future. Okay? So just look at that phrase. The moment you finish that sentence, guess what happens? Look at the words of the priest. The Lord receives you into the Catholic Church. The moment you finish that sentence, that vow, you're Catholic. Now, y'all are Roman Catholic. He's going to be Greek Catholic, at least for a while. <laughs> His loving kindness has led you here so that in the unity of the Holy Spirit, you may have full communion with us and the faith that you have professed in the presence of his family. Here's the interesting thing. That's all he does. We're going to bring him up. We're going to parade him around. This, just kidding. We're going to bring him up just with everyone else. He's going to do his profession of faith. And then we're going to let him go sit down. You know why? <clears throat> because we acknowledge the validity of the Orthodox in their holy orders, in the sacrament of confirmation, baptism, and the Eucharist. He received all those when he were a baby. He was chrismated or confirmed when he was a baby. 
So he is already fully confirmed in a valid confirmation, in a real confirmation. So he will just do the profession of faith and be Catholic. The Lord receives you in his Catholic church, blah, blah, blah. Already did it. After that, after the priest receives you, you go sit down. You begin the celebration. <laughs> I think Father Tom should just go, uh, we're waiting, and then just have you walk out. Yeah, That's fine. Now we begin the invitation rite of confirmation. My dear candidates for confirmation, right? That's now how you're addressed. You are Roman Catholic, and you're now becoming confirmed. By your baptism, you were born again in Christ, so we acknowledge the dignity and validity of your Protestant baptism, right? You were born again in Christ. You have become members of Christ and his priestly people. Now you are to share in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit among us, the Spirit sent by the Lord upon his apostles at Pentecost and given by them and their successors to the baptized. You could say the sacrament of confirmation is our participation in Pentecost. Okay, how cool is it that it's a week before Pentecost that you'll receive this? I love it. The promised strength of the Holy Spirit which you receive will make you more like Christ. What does confirmation do that baptism doesn't? It makes you more like Christ and will help you to be witnesses to his suffering, death, and resurrection. It will strengthen you to be active members of the church and to build up the body of Christ in faith and love. With hand, so that's him. Now with hands joined together, the presider turns and addresses the assembly. He tells us all to pray for you. So he stops looking at you people. And he says, all right, people, let's start praying. Okay. And then he does the laying on of hands. Since there's so many of you, he's going to do the imposition of hands from afar. He's going to spread forth his hands. It's called the Oren's prayer position. And then he will say these words, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brought these your servants to new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, freeing them from sin, send upon them, O Lord, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Not parakeet, paraclete. That's a Greek word. Give them the, and this is the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember your confirmation? A little bit. You remember the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. No? <laughs> you just say no. <laughs> but that's a question that, were you baptized in this diocese or confirmed in this diocese? No. In so, Cardinal DiNardo, that's his favorite thing. He'd be like, all right, so someone tell me what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Someone, and he picks on one of the kids, right? So these are the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and fortitude. The spirit of knowledge and piety. And fill them with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Through Christ our Lord. And we all respond, amen. amen. Okay, not amen, you're not a snob, amen. <laughs> it's a vase, not a vase, I'm just kidding. Um, now, whenever in the Catholic Church during the liturgy, you hear the phrase, through Christ our Lord, and it's almost always said in that cadence, you respond, amen, okay? Then the Father, uh, Father Tom, will come to each one of you individually. He will dip his thumb in the chrism oil, which is you're being chrismated, right? You're becoming another Christ, the word Christ means anointed. And he will say your saint name. How many of you have given us your saint names? How many of you have not given us your saint names? Shame. Shame. <laughs> now, you can take your baptismal name because you've got a rock and baptismal name. Patrick. Yeah. Okay. You can do that. He'll say your saint name. So what's your saint name? Joseph. 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 Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you respond? Uh, you, you, no, you respond. Uh... Amen. All right. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and then he'll say, peace be with you. And what do you respond? And with your spirit. That should not be a weird phrase. We say that at Mass 400 times during the liturgy. Peace be with you and with your spirit. Right? Over and over again in the liturgy we say that. It's a phrase of blessing. So he will come to you as an individual. He will say your saint name, St. Teresa of the Zoo. Or he'll just say, so please, just realize, he's saying your saint name. So don't try to correct him. People have done that in the past. Like, uh, Anthony, it's Jim. <laughs> Awkward. Your freaking saint name. You will have a, uh, it's happened, it really does happen all the time. You will have a name tag with your saint name on your shoulder. Okay? So you will be ready to rock and roll. Um, and he'll just look at your shoulder. Yeah. Um, whenever he says, when uh, it's a anointing. Moment, the anointment, yeah. we all say, and with your spirit, or just the person? Just the person. He's doing it individually. Oh. So what's your saint name? St. Hildegard. 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 You're swinging for the fences on that one. I'm like super Catholic. St. Uh, <laughs> Hildegard, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you say? And with you. And no, with no. Oh, you jump in the gunger. Amen. 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 That's it. Amen. Think about this, right? This is the works-based righteousness of the church that people accuse us of. 
You do nothing. You do next to nothing. You just say amen and with your spirit, and you're confirmed. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your life, because this is the work of the church sanctifying you and making you holy. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you respond, Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And you respond, and with you. Boom, you're confirmed. After he goes through every single one, he'll say some phrase like, Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the newly confirmed in our communion. And everyone goes, <laughs> And you just wait, oh, thank you. And he'll say, You may now return to your seats. And probably the deacon will do one of these. And you just go right back to your seats. Who cares about order? Just go back to your seats. You sit down. And guess what happens? Mass. Normal Mass, we all do the profession of faith, the Nicene Constantinople and Creed, a.k.a. the Nicene Creed. We say the Creed together, and then you receive the body of Christ with the rest of the body of Christ. You receive the Holy Eucharist. You share at the table of the Lord for the first time in our Eucharistic communion with one another. You become what you eat, okay? We all are one body, as St. Paul says, because we partake of the same loaf, okay? So you will receive Holy Communion, and we will practice that Holy Communion on Sunday morning. So we'll have unconsecrated hosts, and I'll say, Body of Christ, and you say, Amen. And I'm going to place it directly on your tongue, not in your hand. Directly on your tongue. Okay? It's about to get real. You ever receive on your tongue? No, no always in your hand? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm going to teach you all how to receive. The normative way is on your tongue. Or if you got junk crap on your hand, you're, you're hanging out with your kid, and you put your hand in a diaper bag, like I have done so many times, and it just comes out covered in mutant infestations, right? You can't receive, you can't put the Lord on that grossy groat hand, right? So what do you do? Receive on your tongue. You stick your tip of your tongue to the bottom of your lip and open your mouth. It's not like, Wah! right? It's not doing that. It's also not a coin slot. <laughs> okay? Tip of your tongue to your mouth, open your mouth. Nothing. Tip of your tongue to the to your lip, and you'll receive. And then you'll go to the chalice, and you will receive the precious blood. Right, so we'll have communion under what we say both species. Right, you can just have it over one or the other. Any of you celiac? Mm-hmm. Okay, good deal. You guys seen the new trailer for Deadpool two? He's like, well, where have you been? He said, I've been busy rounding up all the gluten in the world and shooting it into space so it won't hurt us anymore. Okay, so that's it. Take this piece of paper home and go over it four thousand times. Yes, sir. And you said, you know, the chalice. Do you drink or not drink, or it's an option, or? Uh, your first communion you should drink, just, okay. but you don't have to receive it. You can receive one or the other. You still receive the total Christ. Okay. Right? It's not like Jesus is 50-50. People think that. They're like, oh, I only got half of Jesus today. <laughs> right? People really think that all the time. So uh, if you're a germaphobe, uh, we have one guy who's a total germaphobe, and he looks at the chalice, and he's like, oh, nah. <laughs> so what he and his wife do is they sit in the front row of every mass, so they're the first to receive from that cup <laughs> every single time. Right? So, uh... I would just encourage you to receive from the cup. You'll just take it, take a small sip, a small sip, not a gulp, and uh, and that's it. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. And you don't know about the baptism. I don't. I don't. Baptism comes. All of these will be done for you all at the same time. So you'll get baptized, confirmed. So I gotta find. Uh, I gotta get his approval immediately. I mean, he knows all this stuff. I just don't know if he's expressed it to me or the liturgy people or whatever. But I'll give you an answer tomorrow. Did get only did baptize, confirmed, then buried, and ruled. And confession. Ooh, you don't have to do confession. Because you'll get baptism. Baptism was... wipes away all your sins. These punks have all been baptized before. So I don't have to do confession tomorrow? No. Because oh, wow. you haven't been baptized. Okay. Yeah. I'm tearing up this cup. Tear it. Take a picture of it first. Put it on Instagram. Then tear it up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Deniability. Deniability. That's my middle name. That doesn't make sense.